we uh, honor on this Memorial Day um, all the military personnel who especially has paid the ultimate price for our freedom with their lives. And so we pray, uh, especially this weekend, for family and friends who miss and have lost um, family members or friends that uh, they just still, this, this, this Memorial Day weekend uh, just means so much more uh, to them, um, especially kind of reliving maybe hurts. And so we pray, God, for each of them, God, that you would minister unto them. And so we uh, uh, just commemorate those that um, have given the ultimate price uh, for us and for our, our freedom. Lord, we, we look to you and we realize, Lord, in our, our walk and our Christianity, uh, once again, that we can't do this by ourselves. Lord, the very things that you call us to do, whether it's the Ten Commandments or uh, uh, just a, a, in the New Testament to be able to love one another, um, we realize that we can't do very well in our flesh. God, that we need every day a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit to be able to live out these things that you call us to. And so, God, as we talk about suffering, as we talk about temptations, we pray, Lord, that you would just give us those practical points as we, uh, as we think through those and that we would be able to live obedient lives unto you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm turning to uh, Luke in chapter 22, and we'll pick it up in verse 29, and uh, I entitle our message, when the, sifting, when the Sifting Comes. In the last section we are looking at in Luke from two weeks back, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan is desired to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. So that's where I got the, uh, the imagery from or our title from, uh, this aspect of sifting because the very thing that he was saying, the sifting takes place in our text this morning. And so this week is the, uh, the Last Supper meal is finally over. We had a lot of text involved in that. He had a lot to say at the Last Supper. And so that's over and now they spill out of the upper room, walk across the Kidron Valley over to the Mount of Olives. At the base of that is the Garden of Gethsemane. And so it's not very long of a walk, maybe a half mile, quarter mile to half mile uh, to, to get there. And uh, that's where we find them in the garden, this olive tree garden. You know, I find when uh, I play with my three oldest grandboys, one of them, to remain unnamed, always assigns everyone their role. He is in charge, and we do as he says. And somehow he is always the good guy, and we are always the bad guys. He is going to, you know, wrap us up with something and stick us in the room, and we don't get to come out until he says so. When it comes to our story this morning, it's kind of the same here. Everybody has a role to play. And as they play out that role, we see that all of them fail except Christ. We're going to see each of their weaknesses and each of their failures versus Jesus' faithfulness. We'll see that contrast that's laid out in this story of what Jesus has been called to in his faithfulness. And so we'll see that, that contrast as we, as we go through this. And so we're going to look at two parts. This first one is 39 through 46. I'll read it, and then we'll go back and kind of take it in, in pieces to make our, our points this morning. And so in verse 39, and he came out and went. And so that's Jesus coming out of the upper room. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. So that whole last week of his life on earth, he was spending the night. He would teach in the temple during the day, and at nighttime he would uh, uh, go across the little valley there to the Mount of Olives. Verse 40. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Notice he says the same thing to them both times, that you, here's what the prayer is about, you may not enter into temptation. 
Let's talk about temptation a little bit. Here's what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, pray you will not be tempted. That's not what it says here. And that's, it just, it can't happen. He says, pray then that you may not enter into temptation. Or as the NLT says, give into temptation. That's what you're praying against. It isn't to pray that you won't experience temptation because what? We will. Over and over and over again, all the way to heaven, we will. Pray that you can handle it. That's the issue. That's the issue at hand. And then as we apply that to our lives then, that we're realizing that's what we have to be able to combat these temptations. We can't make them stop. We can pray all they want. God, don't ever let me be tempted. But it's, let me tell you just right up front, he's not going to answer that prayer. There's a reason for temptations and testings that take place in our life that we see all through uh, the scripture here. Let me also say, don't become your own accuser. Have you ever thought this? Ugh, I shouldn't even been tempted by that thought. And a lot of times we start beating ourselves up for the temptation itself, not what we've done with the temptation, but simply that I was temptation with that. It's that all of a sudden that thought that comes to your mind is like, whoa, where did that ever come from? And so with that, a lot of times we've already thought that we failed when the temptation came our way. And you find, as you find yourself being tempted, but Christians, listen up, temptations will come and they're going to come again, and they're going to come again, and they're going to come again. So don't throw in the towel when the temptation comes, feeling that you've already lost. No, that is the time to cry out for his help. In 41 and 42, he withdrew from them, it says, about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed. It seems that this was Jesus saying, give me some space, or I'm going to take some space. I need to be alone. Why? I think because he needs to pray also through his own temptations. I think I'm behind one. There we go. In Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, here's what it says about Christ. For we do not have a high priest, he's representative of our high priest, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's us know that Jesus experienced these things. He went through these temptations also and yet didn't sin. And so we see the temptation itself isn't sin. Again, it's what we do with that. We also see that with confidence we get to draw near the throne of grace. That means we get to pray, pray through our temptations. Lord, help me not to fall to this. And, and so with that, it kind of wraps it all up in those couple of verses there. Let's remember when it comes to temptations, though. Only those who successfully resist a temptation to the end most fully feel the force of that temptation. An example, the weightlifter who successfully lifts and holds overhead the heaviest weight feels the full force of that versus the person that pulls it up halfway and then just drops it right? There's, there's more weight. And matter of fact, you see it and the Olympics time and everything else, those guys get overhead and their whole body just starts shaking. They're holding it. They're feeling the full weight of that. And so any Christian who has successfully faced a temptation to the end knows that it is far more difficult than giving into it at once. We all know the feeling. You're tempted of something and you say, no, ain't going there again. Not being like that dog returning to his vomit, no, and it's a good feeling. And you feel successful in that. And with that, you've cried out to the Lord, you've asked for his help, he's given you help, you walk away from it, and it feels pretty good, right? And so we've felt the full weight of that. So think about this. So it is with Jesus. Everyone he faced, every temptation, he faced to the end and triumphed over it. The temptations were real, and they were, in fact, most real, because he took them to the end and never gave in. Think about that. Jesus gives a double prayer here to his father. Two things. Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. That's his first prayer. Second prayer. Nevertheless, my will, not my will, but your will be done. Those are the back-to-back -back prayers that he's actually praying here. The first one, Father, rescue me from this suffering. Don't want to go through it. The second part of it, 
but accomplish your purposes through me. The God man says, I know suffering is coming and I don't want it. Which is good news for us living in a fallen and broken world where we can be honest and be able to say, I personally, I don't like suffering. I don't know about you, but a lot of times as Christians, we start pretending like it's not that bad. There's others that have had it worse than me and whatever it is, and we try to diminish it that way. And that's not what Jesus does. He knows what he's facing. And he says, can I get out of it? Don't want to go there. Don't want to suffer. So honest. Again, I think sometimes we imagine that super spiritual answer should be in our, in our trials is any suffering that comes our way, any temptation that comes our way is, I don't care. Bring it on. I can handle it. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I can do this. As though suffering is not suffering. As though brokenness is not brokenness. As if hurt is not hurt. Why do we do that? Here Jesus models for us that brokenness in our world is real brokenness. Suffering, real suffering. Hurt, real hurt. One day it's going to all go away. But right now, when we go through the valley of the shadow of death and through trials and through sufferings, it's not only okay to cry out to the Lord and say, I don't like this. And if it's all the same to you, Father, can it not happen? It's okay to be honest with him and to be able to say, this is difficult, I don't want to do this. I want to tap out. Listen to this, you don't have to be Superman. You don't have to be super saint. You don't have to be savior. We already have one of those, right? We don't have to pretend that we're bigger than, stronger than, whatever than, whatever temptation is coming our way. No, suffering is real and suffering is hard and that's why they call it suffering. In John chapter 11, where it says Jesus wept, he's standing there with Mary. Uh, her brother Lazarus had just died. And, and in the conversation where it says Jesus wept, and ultimately that means he was deeply moved within, emotionally struck, just, just going through it. Again, not trying to play it off, but it's real about it. And we need to be also. And so let's be honest in our sufferings. Let's be honest in our trials. The second part of it, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. We see this progression then. Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, it's the if and the nevertheless steps. Not my will, your will be done. Again, I think we imagine that if we're truly spiritual beings that will we'll only want one thing at a time. Now, one thing will be what God wants that will always want to do the right and the holy thing. And so if we don't only want that one thing, we feel like frauds. If we know of some act of obedience that we should do, let's give this analogy. Husbands, you know you're supposed to love your wives as Christ loved the church. And let's say there's some act of service that at that moment you can do for your wife to show her love, but you don't want to at that moment. I'm sure that's never happened to you guys before, but let's just play through the analogy. There's guys at other church that have experienced that, okay? So, but at that point you say, well, I could do that for her, but if I did it, I really don't want to right now, then it's going to be some kind of act of legalism or, or just duty and not, not out of love. And, and so I ought not to do it because that would be fraudulent. And if we stop there, it kind of makes sense. It doesn't for you ladies, but it does in our minds. Now, please see here, what just took place. Jesus does not want to go through suffering, and yet, he wants a greater want that supersedes his lesser want, and then it controls his actions moving forward. He does have both of these in his head, in his mind, what he's struggling with. Don't want this to happen, always want this to happen, that's the greater one. That's the one I'm going to follow, and thus, that's what's going to change my, my will moving forward to do the right, the right thing. He's honest about the fact. He doesn't want to go through suffering, but again, he wants something even more than not wanting to go through suffering. What does he want? He wants the Father's purposes and will to be accomplished. 
No, I might not want to serve somebody at this time. I just sat down on the couch. I just did, you know, whatever it is. But for the greater good, I'm going to do this. That's what he does. Anytime the Spirit is prompting you to obedience that you don't want to do, it's not about pretending that you want to. That's not it. It's about choosing the greater want over the lesser want. And so we can actually want multiple things at one time. And that's okay. You're thinking already, again, feeling guilty because I'm, I'm thinking both of these things are going on in my head and I feel like I've already lost the battle there. No, that's normal. Just choose the right one. How do we choose the right one? Again, going back to the throne of grace saying, help me to serve. Give me a mind to serve, a heart to serve. Help me to be obedient in this. And thus, it's not fraudulent. It becomes faithfulness. Jesus is showing us the path of faithfulness when we're wrestling with something so difficult in our mind like this of how to choose the greater over the lesser. And he says this, he says, would you remove this cup from me? Which doesn't simply mean, <clears throat> I don't wanna do this lot in life. Feels like I drew the short straw. I don't like this role in my life. No, 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 the cup. Because he uses that phrase, and it's a, an Old Testament phrase that definitely means something, maybe even deeper than we've read this before. See, it's this powerful Old Testament image that is given. One of the places in Isaiah 51, 17, and it's specifically the cup of God's fury or the cup of God's wrath. So he's not just saying, I don't want to go to the cross because it's going to hurt. It's something much deeper than that. This cup is full of God's wrath against his enemy, and I'm about to take upon myself. That's the issue. Oh, the physical stuff, that, that's going to be hard enough. That's going to be bad. But there's, there's another layer behind that or on top of that that he's speaking to. In Jeremiah 25, 15, it uses the cup again. Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath, and then it says, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I'm sending among them. This is this cup of wrath because of our sin, because of what we've done to a holy and righteous God, that he is so holy and we are so sinful, and so that because of that, uh, transcendent you know, gap between those two, that's what's supposed to happen. But in the New Testament, we read of the gospel, we read of the good news, this cup was not poured out on you and I and our nation, but poured out on Christ. As Timothy Keller said, who just went to be with Jesus this week, the gospel is that you are so lost and so flawed and so sinful that Jesus had to die for you. But you were also so loved and so valued that Jesus was glad to die for you. I like that. Well, the cup wasn't removed. He was already suffering right there in Gethsemane even before he gets to the cross. There in agony is what Luke's text says there. And the weight of the prayers were causing this profuse sweat off of his body, down to the ground, like, which is a simile, great drops of blood. Please hear this, that though his prayer was answered with a no, you hear that? Jesus asked something to the Father, and the Father said no. We let this cup go, come from me. No. It's a no. But what immediately happens after God's no, the Father's no to the Son He sent an angel from heaven to strengthen him. Now, I don't know exactly what that strengthening was. I imagine it was physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, all of those things. But I, but I think of, uh, for you and I to be able to remember of just our presence to be there when somebody is hurting, when they're suffering, when they're going through something. A lot of times, it's not about what you say or what you do. A lot of times, it's that you showed up, Right? A lot of times we can show up for friends, we can show up for our missionaries and come alongside them and run, just to remind them, hey, you're loved, you are cared for by God, you are not forgotten, you're doing a great work, keep doing it, keep going, and hopefully there's a strengthening that happens there. 
But here is the father telling the son no to one of his prayers, but immediately bringing the strength to be able to handle the no. And you think he does it the same for us? You don't get all yeses. (laughs) Neither do I. Neither did Jesus. You're going to get some no's, maybe a lot of no's. But as he gives you the no, he gives you the strength to be able to handle the no or the result of that no, I should say. Verse 45 and 46, see, Jesus returns to the disciples who are not the uh, epitome of faithfulness in the story, right? We know from Matthew's account, this actually happened three times where he's a stone throws away. Let's say it's at the back door. He walks back over to them. You guys are sleeping again? And so this happens three different times. So what we have here is the the third and the, the last time that Luke writes down. So the disciples, they're not the epitome of faithfulness in the story, but more of failure like us in our life story. Oftentimes, just like the disciples here, we're no different. It's a lot of times it's failure being in contrast with his faithfulness. Only Luke is the one who tells us why they fell asleep, why they were sleeping. Specifically says, for sorrow. Probably just absolutely exhausted from the heaviness and the weightiness of the temptation that they were in right then probably experienced that before and whatever horrific thing hit your life and to where you're just so exhausted you just want to sleep maybe you just want to escape and you want to sleep maybe it's just I just don't want to think right now we just go to sleep maybe it's just so much and so overwhelming especially as things start stacking up in your life things at work or school home life, friends, bills piling up, disease, physical pain, whatever it is. And it's not just one, okay, handle that one. Two, uh, I'm getting weary. Three, I'm pretty weary now. And you're saying, Lord, I can't take anymore. Four, five, six. And they just hit. And that's that time where you just, I just want to go to bed. And so we have their, their contrast, which is really our contrast in the story for our failures versus Christ's beautiful faithfulness in the story let's take the second story 47 through 53 while he was still speaking there came a crowd and the man called Judas one of the 12 was leading them and he drew near to Jesus to kiss him but Jesus said to him Judas would you betray the son of man with a kiss and when those who were around him saw what would follow they said so his disciples Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. And then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour. And the power of darkness. He closes with that. An hour of darkness. Doesn't define it out, but letting them know, again, there's this other layer that you don't even see in the unseen realm of what Satan is doing and all of what you're doing. We first feel the weight of even the way Luke writes this out. It was Judas, one of the twelve, who came to betray him with a kiss. The kiss. Uh, you need, they needed a signal. They had to come up with something to be able to pitch black out there, middle of the night. And so with that, he had to come up with something. But instead of rubbing his belly or patting himself on the head, I know. And so he came up with this. It's the one that I kiss. He's chosen this, this, this kiss here. I like first how Jesus, just the the tenderness of using his name, not, oh, it's you, oh, it's that guy, you know, it's the traitor, it's the, you know, he could have came up with a number of different names, but he chooses Judas, which is from Judah, which means praise, reminding him of who he is, reminding him of the name that was given to him, which is such a beautiful name, or at least came out of that to Judas, which no parents call their kid Judas today. A kiss, usually 
Normally, something of intimacy, something of love, respect, affection, uh, friendship, devotion. Judas basically says, ha, I played you. Three years I played you. This was... This kiss was not only his way of sticking in the knife, but then twisting it at the end. That's what the kiss is all about here. Now, what would you do? You're one of the disciples. You're standing next to Jesus. What would you do? Well, you'd probably do what you would do for a buddy, what you would do for a friend. You'd probably do the exact same thing that one of the disciples did here. We know from another account, I think Mark's account, that it was actually Peter who did that. We don't know why he missed and only got an ear, but... Uh, but anyways, as, as, as he does that, we would probably respond in, in the same way or at least the, probably the wrong way. And that's where, where, where Jesus jumps in and says, stop this. Now, I'm sure in their mind they had every reason why they would do it. I mean, just a couple you know, chapters back, he was talking about, well, now, before I told you don't bring a sword, now I say bring a sword. Got one! And, and was ready to use it. But Jesus jumps in, says, stop this, and then heals him. I like the quote by G. Campbell Morgan. He said, his last act of divine surgery performed by the tender fingers of Jesus made necessary by the blundering zeal of a disciple, which I think Jesus is still doing today of all of our blunders of his disciples. When we do stupid things, say stupid things, that he's, he's constantly touching healing ears. Sorry you had to hear that from that Christian. And he's, he's still running around helping us out with that. What was Jesus doing in all of that? He was just showing us how to live out. Not my will, but your will be done. You can't stop the Father's will. I'd already prayed for it. It's a no. How, you're not going to stop it with a sword. You're not going to stop what I'm doing by going to the cross. You're not, you're not going to be able to stop that. And if you really understood it, like the Father understood it, you wouldn't want to stop that because it's for your sake. The last two verses, he simply turns and addresses the mob that showed up. Basically, he's saying, I've been operating in, in light. You guys, here you are in the darkness. Every day, This week, I've been in the temple, and you could have grabbed me at any time. But here you are. You got your clubs and everything else. I'm not resisting. But you guys are in the darkness, which is consistent with who you are, your plan, your desires. This is your hour, he calls it. The hour of darkness, he calls it. For them, for that group that he's addressing here, everything was going according to their plan. They've been trying this for chapters. How are we going to do it? Trying to plot it. We can't do it in front of the masses of the people. They'll, they'll, they'll rebel against us. Look what they did when John the Baptist was beheaded. And so with that, they're, they're conniving. They're trying to figure out what's, what's the plan? How do we get him? How do we kill him? They're trying to figure this out. And so everything is going perfectly according to their plan. Luke has been revealing for us Satan's plan. Satan's plan of destruction, even as he's been revealing Jesus' plan of salvation. And it's become apparent that they both are driving towards the exact same object. They're both striving to get, they're trying to kill him, and the Father's trying to get him to the cross, right? This is what's happening here. Jesus' enemies are bending all of their efforts and their ingenuity to bring him to the cross, and yet this is the very cup the Father has given him to drink. See, what's happening here is something called concurrence. Con- concurrence means running together. If you picture two streams that are side by side, and all of a sudden, when they get together, all of a sudden, they're bigger and stronger on down the road. And it's these different rivers coming together, and that's happening here. A good example of that is in Job chapter 1. You have What the father is doing, he's talking to Satan. What Satan's doing, what the Midianites are doing, coming and attacking Job. You got what Job's doing, what his family's doing. Then you have all of these streams running together that, that make up the story of the next 42 chapters. Concurrence. This is the merging of their hour of darkness and the merging of Jesus' hour of why he came, the cross, and providentially blending them together, showing that God is in command. And he's doing the same in our lives today. As our life comes along somebody else's life, let's say at marriage, I use that as a marriage analogy, this concurrence, because it's two streams that have been separate. And now as they come together, and you know what happens when two come together? It stirs up a bunch of muck off the bottom there. 
and it's kind of dirty and yucky for a little while. But pretty soon, it, it gets, they, they get it all figured out, and they get down the ways, and they're stronger together, right? That, that's just a good example of marriage right there. Come on. Come on. You agree. You're just not wanting to laugh because your spouse is sitting next to you. But that's, you know. Hey, this week, the sifting will come for you and me. It just is. The sifting will come. The temptations will come. But Jesus reminds us of what he reminded Peter. But I have prayed for you. And that's where this is fought. It's so hard. Now, it's impossible for you and I to fight against this unseen realm. It's hard to fight. No, it's impossible to fight against an enemy you can't see. And thus, we need that prayer power. We need that fresh filling of his spirit. We need his help every single day for a Christian walk. I don't care how mature you are in the Lord, how many decades that you have walked with him and everything else. We need him today. Can I get an amen? amen? Stand strong in his might. Not in your own. Stand strong in his might, saints. Let's pray. Father, Again, thank you for this reminder. We know this, but we need to be reminded of this. Lord, we look to you. We recognize again we need your help. Lord, with every bit of sifting the enemy tries to do with us in our lives. Lord, not only the sifting, but the temptations that come flying our way. The trials that you place in our lives to be able to mature us and cause us to grow. Lord, we realize like in the Proverbs of the person that falls seven times, help us to rise again each and every time. Lord, help us to cry out unto you. Help us to boldly run to your throne of grace, seeking your help, and thus give you all the credit, all the rewards, all the honor. Go unto you, for you are our God. And we find our strength in you and our wisdom and knowledge in you to lead us through this broken world, the hurt and the suffering that oftentimes goes with that. But God, we love you in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.